Good morning, church family. We're going to learn a new song this morning, Lord Have Mercy on Us. So listen to this first verse. Try and remember the tune and the melody, and then we'll all sing it together.
God, we thank you for your mercy that's new to us today. And now we praise you for your faithfulness, even when we're not faithful.
Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. More than likely, you may not have heard of these men, though in their day, they, at the height of their career, were what we would call movers and shakers of culture highly influential, impacting their world in the last 75 years or so. Well, just in case, here's a pop quiz. I'll give you their names. Uh, what do you know about Hugh Johnson, Haile Selassie, or Harlow Curtis? Hugh Johnson was the man behind the scenes crafting the New Deal in 1933, uh, considered response, the person responsible for Roosevelt winning the office as often as he did. He put American business back on its feet following the Great Depression. Haile Selassie was the emperor of Ethiopia. He traced his lineage back to King Solomon, reigning in the, this country until 1974. He was considered the defining figure in modernizing Ethiopia. What about Harlow Curtis? Well, he was the president of General Motors when in 1955, for the first time in a single year, they did the unthinkable, earning $1 billion of revenue. Now, although these three men had an influence that exists in many people's lives to this day, from different countries of origin, uh, slightly different generations. They had one thing in common. They were awarded Time Magazine's Man of the Year. And their faces adorned the cover of the magazine as they were given this featured award. The fact that you more than likely don't know who they are or even how their lives have impacted us today, it, it proves that history comes equipped with an eraser. Even recent history tends to erase the legacies of people that we uh, might think are unforgettable, the movers and shakers of our world. It's actually a good reminder that Significance on earth doesn't last. It made me think of that poem my mother used to teach us and remind us of, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will what? Last. History all too quickly pulls out an eraser on what seems to be something never forgotten. But history also provides us with insight and perspective, doesn't it? In fact, if you take the time to look through the list of inductees into this particular Hall of Fame, some of them who are thought to be unique, positive, special, dynamic, helpful, history proved otherwise. Uh, for instance, Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1923, exactly 100 years ago, was Benito Mussolini. He styled himself as Napoleon. He was considered an influential leader. He became the personal ally and friend, though, of Adolf Hitler, a brutal fascist dictator in his own right, murdering anybody in his way. Most of it hidden until later, as history has a way of revealing the truth. I was curious about him winning this award, and so I, I went to Time Magazine's cover story, printed in 1923, to read it. And I want to quote from it, and I think it'll speak for himself, for itself. Mussolini exhibits remarkable self-control, rare judgment, and an efficient application of his ideas. 
He kills you if you get in his way. That's efficient in getting his ideas across. Well, eventually his bloody reign will end. His own countrymen will put him in front of a firing squad and then hang him publicly. And history revealed the truth. If you were living uh, 2,000 years ago, one particular individual would have been considered the defining figure in the Middle East. He would have won, uh, hands down, more than once time, Man of the Year award. He was a member of one of the most famous family dynasties in this region. A half dozen kings, in fact, will be related to him. He was appointed king by the emperor of Rome himself. He will be mentioned by name more than any other king in the New Testament. His official name was King Herod Antipas. He was the son of Herod the Great. And more than likely, you remember Herod the Great. He was the one who encountered the wise men, tried to trick them. Because they tricked him instead, he ordered the slaughter of all of the baby boys in the region of Bethlehem. A brutal man. His son was the same, brutal, cruel, immoral. He would seduce his current wife during the ministry of Jesus uh, into marrying him and leaving her husband, and her husband happened to be Herod's brother. He was a coward and a killer. In fact, his new wife was so enraged that John the Baptist would publicly declare their marriage sinful that Herod would eventually comply with her desire to have John the Baptist killed, his head literally delivered to her on a platter. You think times are tough now? Imagine in, that, in this culture that happening. Imagine a preacher having his head taken off and delivered on a platter to the wife of the president of our country. It will be in front of this king that Jesus will eventually stand trial and interestingly not say a word to him. But, but, but for now, uh, I don't want to get too far ahead, uh, for now, from all external evidences that we would have if we lived back here, he's in power. He's in control. He shapes destinies. He defines countries and legacies. Who's in control of Galilee? Oh, King Herod, Antipas. But in, in hindsight, we will see the tragic and humiliating death of Herod and the power of the gospel. And that's because history will reveal that Herod was not in power. Heaven was. It wasn't so much Herod on the throne as it was God behind the scenes on the throne. And we need to remember that today. Simply put, heaven rules. We need to live as if it does, because it does. And it will make a difference in how we think and live and respond to our world today. Now, that's all sort of backdrop. For the first time, uh, we have here the connection of Jesus and this Herod, Antipas. And, and just in this little encounter, you have a little bit of fireworks, which I found intriguing. So let's take our Bibles and go back to Luke's gospel. We're in chapter 13. If you're new to us uh, today, we've been listening in as Jesus invited his audience to enter the narrow gate, to, to enter the kingdom, which is to enter the family of God through the narrow gate. It's narrow and not so much in reference to its size, but in reference to its singularity. 
It is the only door. In fact, Jesus will say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You got to go through that door. In fact, the Lord will call himself a door. In John's gospel, as we were reminded, where he would say, I am the door. Anyone who enters through me, by me, will be saved. That's the narrow, exclusive claim of Christianity. Now, following that invitation, Jesus seems to be somewhat interrupted. Verse 31 is where we pick it up now for today. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Stop for a moment. This is an alarming message. Herod Antipas wants Jesus dead. And if Herod Antipas wants you dead, you're as good as dead. We're informed in Matthew's gospel that around this time he is tormented by guilt for having killed John the baptizer. He's tortured by this innocent death. He's terrified, Matthew tells us, that Jesus is the resurrection of John. That somehow Jesus is John the baptizer come back to haunt him. And so the only thing he can think of doing is what he does best, kill him. So he, 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 he puts out a, a contract, as it were, on his head. He plans to, to kill the Lord. Now, if I could break down this passage into several principles that we can live by today, uh, as we recognize the sovereignty of God and the power of God and, and the simple fact that heaven rules, here would be the first one that I would want to point out before we go any further. Number one, Serving the Lord faithfully will, will not eliminate enemies or critics. Imagine the irony of this. Verse 31 again. Get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. What's Jesus been doing? Healing people. Curing people. Delivering people. Forgiving people. Straightening out erroneous religious traditions. Helping. If anybody deserved to have nothing but a long line of friends, it would be, it would be Jesus. In fact, if any ruler had any sense, they'd invite him into the palace. And yet, we know, if you're old enough in the faith, you know, the first time he arrives at the palace, he will be on trial. Ignored up to that point. You ransack the scriptures, beloved, and you will find one account after another uh, sort of delivering this principle that opportunity is always met by opposition. You begin to openly profess Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Master and just watch. Enemies will line up faster than friends. In fact, you might lose some friends. The Bible says all who desire to live a godly life will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12. That varies in degree from generation to generation, from nation to nation. But rather than the church complaining that we don't have enough friends in society at least in our generation, maybe we should be complaining that we don't have enough enemies. Serving God faithfully will not eliminate enemies or critics. It might, it might multiply them. By the way, there's a lot of debate and a lot of ink that I won't bore you with, but there, there's a question as to the incentive, the motive of the Pharisees saying this to Jesus. They obviously don't care if he's dead. In fact, they're already planning to kill him themselves. So why are they warning him here? Well, are they telling Jesus it's because they hope that Jesus will respond and they can drive him into Jerusalem, which would be 
safe from Herod because Herod doesn't rule over Jerusalem. Pilate does. And Pilate's in the back pocket of the high priest. Well, if they can get him into Jerusalem, they could get the Sanhedrin to arrest him. Maybe, maybe they just want him out of their town. Perhaps the reason is that they're hoping he'll hear this news and make a run for it. And if he makes a run for it, that'll discredit his claim that no one, he said, will take my life from me. I lay it down on my account. Well, if he hears this news and runs for the hills, he evidently isn't in control of his life after all. We're not told, but we do know that Herod has already killed John the Baptist, and he can kill Jesus too. So get this here. The faithful ministry, the compassionate ministry of Jesus, the godly walk of Jesus has now only added one more enemy and a very powerful one to a growing list. For doing what? Perhaps like you've experienced or maybe experiencing now today in some form. For doing the right thing. Here's a second principle of how we should live in light of the fact that heaven rules. Number two, opposition should not reroute our mission nor rewrite our message. I want you to notice again verse 31. And at the very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course. Go tell that fox. I kind of like that, don't you? Although when I was a teenager, guys called a pretty girl a fox. Not me, of course. I was off reading my Bible somewhere during that <laughs> time. Well, that's not going on here. One author explains it by going back into culture during the days of our Lord, and he's using a little bit of holy sarcasm here. A fox in that day was a person who was crafty, cunning, but too small to really do any damage. Insignificant, but a nuisance. So it's as if the Lord is saying, uh, you're, you're really just a little nuisance. You're not going to stand in my way. You might be King Herod, but you're no comparison to the King of Heaven. You might think you're something, but history has an eraser, and it gives insight. So Jesus says, essentially, go tell that fox, that crafty little guy, I'm not slowing down. Reminded me of Hugh Latimer, perhaps if you've been to Oxford, you've stood there as Marsha and I did where Latimer and two others were martyred, burned at the stake under the reign of Bloody Mary. Before that time, he was a faithful pastor, the chaplain to the king, King Edward, and, and he would be preaching on one occasion, history recorded, while King Edward was on the throne and while he was preaching his message in Westminster Abbey, King Edward VI slipped into the abbey and sat down. Latimer continued preaching, but he said this, Latimer, Latimer, be careful what you say. The King of England is here. And then he continued by saying, Latimer, Latimer, be careful what you say. The king of kings is here. That's the perspective here. Look, Jesus isn't just putting on a brave face. He's demonstrating absolute confidence in his father. He understands that his death is predetermined by God the Father, and until that time arrives, Herod can't do one thing about it. By the way, it's the same for you and me today. Did you notice that Jesus says here that he's going to keep on casting out demons and curing people? It's another way of saying a volume in a 
small phrase. It, he's going to keep preaching the message of forgiveness and, and deliverance and sovereignty over the world or kingdom of darkness. He's, gonna, he's also going to stay on track. Notice here it says, until the third day when I finish my course. That's a reference to the glorious resurrection of Jesus that cannot be stopped by all of the power of hell. You see, Jesus is demonstrating here what happens when you live as if you actually believe that heaven rules, which we should because it does. He's effectively quoting the perspective of Psalm 31, 15. Oh God, my, my times are in your hands. You're in control. Sometimes, doesn't it seem like life unfolds by accident? By, by some coincidence? By someone else's decision over your life? By someone's power over you? By chance, by luck, by fate. Now, life unfolds by God's design under God's supervision. Even sin and evil cannot derail God's ultimate plan throughout history. And there are times when we, we do not know what God is up to. But then there are times when after a little bit more time, we see what God had in mind. Oh, I thought that person was crafting my life. Oh, oh I thought that person was in control of my life. Oh, I, I thought that accident, those events were shaping my world. Oh, indirectly. But God is behind the scene moving the events of your life and mine toward his ultimate purposes even when there doesn't seem to be rhyme or reason, just chaos and trouble. But later you realize perhaps in some instances, oh, I see what God was doing. Reminded me of Joseph as an older, wiser Man to his brothers when they showed up in Egypt. And he said to them in that classic encounter, you meant it for evil. And let me tell you, it was evil. I'm paraphrasing now. You messed up my life. It was horrible. It was lonely. I shed buckets of tears. I couldn't believe as hard as I tried, everything went against me. Why did Potiphar believe his wife? Why did those men forget me? I was going to rot in jail. I thought it was all over. But now, he can say, looking back, brothers, it's clear, isn't it? You meant it for evil, but God superintended. God supervised. God overruled your evil for good, for good. See, with that perspective, then Joseph was, un, he was able to do the unthinkable, forgive his brothers. How do you do that? Well, when you know that heaven rules, even your enemies are viewed differently, and that's the third principle I want to draw from this passage, antagonism and hatred should not eliminate a spirit of compassion. Verse 33, note that, nevertheless, he says, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. In other words, I'm going to eventually get to Jerusalem. That's where prophets typically die. <laughs> a little sarcasm there as well. Then he says, oh, speaking of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Underscore that last phrase. You were not willing. Listen, at the heart of unbelief 
is an unwilling heart. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that, that's a sob of anguish. That's not a declaration of anger. He is weeping here when he rides into Jerusalem later on that donkey. It's often overlooked that he's literally sobbing. And you think, wait a second. Get this here. He's just expressed trust and faith in the power of his father, He's just told Herod, you crafty little fox, you're not going to slow me down. You're not going to change my message. Even though he already knows Jerusalem's going to reject him, the nation, he already knows he's going to be crucified. He already knows he's going to be resurrected. He's weeping. Why? Because he is both God and aware of the future, and he is man feeling everything in the present, just like you would feel and I would feel. There's nothing more hurtful than to offer love to someone and have them refuse the offer. There's nothing more bitter, William Barclay writes on this, than to give your heart to someone only to have it broken. And that's what's happening in the heart of Jesus as he faces Jerusalem. He invites mankind, but mankind rejects him. There there are no more tragic words, frankly, in all of Scripture than what you're reading here. I would have gathered you under my wings, but you would not. Because of their defiance, Jesus now predicts their devastation Verse 35, behold, your house is forsaken. The house is left desolate, the house of Jacob, that is the house of Israel. The temple will be destroyed, the house of God. Both the nation and the temple will be desolate. The people will be scattered. And to this day, beloved, this prediction is ongoing Israel to this day fights for every square inch that they could somehow get and they do not occupy yet the land that will be theirs in the coming kingdom. Just a piece of it for now. Could be a temporary partial return, some theologians believe, setting the stage for the final return during the tribulation. But right now, what's going on? They have no king. They have no temple. They have no high priest. They have no sacrifice. The house is desolate. Then the Lord gives this wonderful prediction of a future day, verse 35 again, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a reference to the return of Jesus Christ after the tribulation period. God has regathered Israel during that tribulation, which is primarily for the nation Israel. Those 144,000 Jewish evangelists have spread around the globe. God will call his people back to keep his promise. Then the nation will repent, Paul writes in Romans 11, and all Israel will be saved as Jesus descends with us to set up his millennial kingdom. But in the meantime... What's happening here to this generation? They're rejecting the Lord. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, defying the Lord brings his judgment. Jesus, however, says, you refuse to come unto me, John chapter 5, verse 40, that you might have life. How about you? Is this one more invitation from God to be refused. I think of Joseph Stalin. As I was looking through that list, I found that he also was named Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1942. He was hailed as a hero for stopping Adolf Hitler, but he himself would become a brutal dictator over the Soviet Union. As a young man, he had attended seminary 
He was preparing for ministry in the Orthodox Church. We're not exactly told what. We just know that he never studied, failed his grades, lived an immoral life, and eventually left seminary declaring himself to be an atheist. When he rose to power, he would do everything he could to crush Christianity. And you are aware of what life was like to some degree in the Soviet Union during these days. He had millions of people die of starvation by his programs to bring nations and the Union under control. Stalin means steel, and Joseph Stalin bragged of that, indicating that he was living up to his name. He was a man of steel. He was steel-like and strong, but history would reveal a different reality. In his palace, he had seven bedrooms. He would sleep in a different bedroom every night, terrified of assassination. He knew that the people to whom he gave no mercy would have no mercy on him. He even employed a household servant to do nothing more than monitor his tea bags to try to make sure he wouldn't be poisoned. His daughter, Svetlana, would defect to the United States after her father's death. I've read most of her biography. And on one occasion, she visited Malcolm Muggeridge, a brilliant Christian journalist who'd suffered himself in that part of the world, committed believer, Svetlana talked to him about her father's death, and she was curious as to what he might have done just before he died on his deathbed. Muggeridge asked her what she was referring to. She said that just before he died, he'd been lying, basically unconscious. But at that moment, just prior to his death, he suddenly opens his eyes, sits up in bed, clenches his fists and raises them to the ceiling and shakes them and then falls back on his pillow and dies. Muggeridge said, it would be my understanding because of your father's hatred for God and for the gospel. This was one final invitation and one final refusal. But what about you? Are you standing against him or with him? Better yet, for him. What do you expect out of life if you stand for him? I recommend Luke chapter 13, as to what we should expect. And I think the only way a believer can truly stand with confidence and joy and hope is to know heaven rules. The throne of God is over all the kingdoms of this earth. And one day it will be apparent as he alone reigns in his kingdom. Our times are in his hand. With that in mind, let me give you very quickly two principles of application. Let me just mention them and then we're finished. Number one, the power of of nations or political leaders can never derail the purposes of God. God is in control. God is in control of them. The heart of the king is in his hand. He turns it wherever he will. His plans are on track. They are on course. They're on time. Secondly, the defiance of unbelievers has not yet eliminated an invitation from God. How are you responding to his invitation today?